Good evening and welcome to an online forum on restorative to justice with two candidates for District Attorney of Multnomah County. I'm your moderator, Jason Renault. Tonight we'll meet and get to know the two men competing for the position of District Attorney of Multnomah County. Briefly, our District Attorney is responsible for prosecuting persons arrested and accused of committing cr state criminal law violations in Multnomah County. They also prosecute persons with mental illness to be confined until released by a hospital physician. The office manages the LEADS program. That's the new uh, Law Enforcement Assisted Diversion Program. Uh, they manage a couple of different kinds of drug court. They manage our mental health court and programs which offer diversion from prosecution for alcoholics and addicts, and also the community court and the neighborhood associations uh, program. All in all, our district attorney is one of the most powerful and important elected positions in our community. And for the first time in a long time, your vote is in this position is going to matter. The position of district attorney has been held by just two men since 1981. That's 39 years for a little context. Billy Ray Bates was our shooting guard for the Portland Trailblazers in 1981. And Raiders of the Lost Ark was the number one film. Frank Ivancy, a Republican was mayor and Vic Atiyah, a Republican, was governor. It was a very different time. And since 1981, there's been no substantial political challenger for the seat. Without a challenge, the incumbent of district attorney alone has won race after race. This long duration without a political race, without a community-wide discussion about the prosecution of law has itself shaped how the law is understood, administrated, and prosecuted in our community. And now in 2020, there's an open seat for the position and two well-qualified, knowledgeable, well-regarded uh, candidates. It's time, for the first time in a long time, for the voters of Multnomah County to make a choice. Now, this forum was planned as a public community-driven event. Because of the COVID-19 and the governor's stay-at-home order, we've reformatted the forum to be online. Because the community itself can't attend, I've selected five questioners for the candidates. Ed Jones is a former public defender and retired Multnomah County Circuit Court judge. Jason Jones is an adjunct instructor from Portland State University's Department of Criminal Justice and Criminology. Tawana Sanchez is our House Representative from District 43. And Joyce Harris is an educator and black activist. Now in 1970, Joyce co-founded the Black Education Center, a school aimed at providing elementary age children with reading, math, and African-American cultural history. That's in 1970. Their questions are pre-recorded and have not been shown to the candidates. Now, Rabbi Ariel Stone of Congregation Shatikva will frame our discussion in a moment and give us a working definition of restorative justice. The candidates have had a chance to see the rabbi's comments and she also has a few questions. And further for the sake of neutrality, as moderator and convener of this forum, I'd like to say I've never met these two men before last night. And for clarification, the forum is not supported or funded or created by Multnomah County or its district attorney's office. Now, some of the formality for the typical public candidate forum will be waived tonight, but the candidates have been told to keep to a specific amounts of time to their responses to questions. I hope they do, but if they don't, I will interrupt if they go beyond the time allotted. We hope to keep this forum about two hours in length. Now, the candidates are Ethan Knight and Mike Schmidt, and I'll let them both introduce themselves in a moment. I've also asked each candidate to provide a recorded statement from one of their own supporters to bolster and enlarge their candidacy claim. Those recorded statements will be from Dr. Elizabeth Lati of OHSU and Casey Jama of Unite Oregon. Uh, excuse me, Dr. Lati for Ethan Knight and Casey Jama for Mike Schmidt. Now, Dr. Elizabeth Lati is a clinical educator and hospitalist at OHSU. She is the director of Native, uh, narrative medicine and where she teaches uh, the reflective practice to uh, interprofessional students, residents, and faculty with, who have a particular interest in identity formation and in resilience through story. And Casey Jama of United Oregon has been awarded the Skidmore Prize for Outstanding Young Nonprofit Professionals, the Oregon Immigrant 
Achievement Award, the Lowenstein Trust Award, which is presented yearly to that person who demonstrated the greatest contribution to assisting the poor and underprivileged in Portland, and the 2012 Portland Peace Prize. Quite great uh, 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 supporters. Now, I'd like to invite the candidates to introduce themselves, and we'll start with Ethan Knight. Ethan? Great. Uh, thank you so much, everyone, for joining us this evening, and thank you, Jason, for that introduction. Uh, well, good evening, everyone. Uh, my name is Ethan Knight, and I'm one of the two candidates for Multnomah County District Attorney. I'm currently an assistant United States attorney in Portland, and I've spent over 20 years as a state and federal prosecutor in Oregon. Uh, but let me tell you most importantly why I'm running and then why I think restorative justice intersects with my vision for the Multnomah County District Attorney's Office. I'm running for district attorney because I love this community. And at a time of crisis, when we need steady leadership to address both the challenges in the criminal justice system and the needs of those who enter and exit the criminal justice system, I believe I'm the best candidate for that job. In my over 20 years in the criminal justice system, I've confronted virtually every case and every challenge that we have, from the smallest of cases to helping build our community court program, to environmental crimes, victim crimes, including robbery and homicide, and then as a federal prosecutor, I've handled a substantial amount of public corruption, national security, domestic terrorism, international terrorism, and espionage. Uh, beyond those credentials though, and the time I've spent in the system, I've spent a time as well as an advocate in the legal system, as president of the Oregon Law Foundation, and a number of other roles advocating for those in the profession of law and on behalf of those who have needs for legal services. And this is all informed where we started a few moments ago. I believe that this critical function that we talked about just moments ago that serves the people of Multnomah County, that is responsible for prosecuting the roughly 10,000 cases a year that come into Multnomah County, needs to be handled in a way with foresight and care and an understanding of the system. And understanding that there are reforms that we need to make, reforms that target the needs of underserved communities, both victims and defendants, reforms that address some of the fundamental ways those who are poor come through the system, and reforms that acknowledge that some of our sentencing schemes in the past haven't worked. By that same token, by virtue of the fact I have spent considerable time in the system, I know that some things do work, that there are those in the system who do do a good job, that there are things that are effective in addressing some of our unmet needs, and there are things that can be steadied and moved ahead in the coming years and months. So above all, what I bring to the position and what I hope to discuss this evening is an understanding that the role of district attorney is critical for advancing the needs of everyone in the community, not just in the criminal justice system, and that the concept of restorative justice and the notion of a needs-based practice of acknowledging there is more to the system than simply punishing or simply sentencing involves acknowledging the nuance and intricacies of the system in an effort to meet those needs. And I'm the candidate to do just that. Thank you so much. Well, thanks, Ethan. Mike, how are you? Are you, how are you this evening? Are you ready to introduce yourself? Yeah, thank you, Jason. Uh, and thanks for everybody who's putting this forum on and, and getting us together to have this critical conversation about restorative justice and the intersection of the district attorney's office. So my name's Mike Schmidt. Uh, one of the other two candidates running for this position. And I'm running because I believe that we need major reform now in our criminal justice system. My first job out of college was to be a high school teacher. And I went and did that thinking I was gonna learn a lot about our education system. And I did, but what I unexpectedly learned was a lot about our criminal justice system and how in my students' lives that played out. I taught in the public schools of New Orleans uh, and my students didn't have uh, the privilege that I had uh, as an upbringing, uh, and they had to deal with a lot of being victims of crime, witnesses to crime, uh, sometimes children of incarcerated parents, and then uh, every so often victim or defendants themselves. I saw how the criminal justice system had impacts on their lives and their ability to thrive. So in 2005, I moved to Portland and went to law school at Lewis and Clark, and I studied criminal law. I wanted to get into the system to be the change that I thought could happen. And I got a job at the district attorney's office where I prosecuted from 2007 to 2013, handled felony cases, drug court cases, uh, in the mental health court, uh, misdemeanor cases. Uh, so I did that work. And although I felt like I was helping people, 
I didn't feel like I was changing anything or changing the system. So in 2013, I got out. I went and worked at the legislature and then ultimately landed at the Criminal Justice Commission, a state agency that uses research and data to look at how we can improve the effectiveness and the efficiency of our criminal justice system. Ultimately, when you talk to people like our sheriff or our director of corrections, uh, and they, they tell you that our prisons and our jails are the largest homeless shelters in the state, they're our largest addiction treatment facilities in the state. They're our largest mental health treatment facilities in the state. You know that what we're doing is not working. Uh, so that's why I started off this campaign with a bold 28 point plan uh, that you can see on my website. Uh, but ultimately the things that I'm fighting for is to have a district attorney that is gonna stand up to ICE uh, and immigration and let the communities, our immigrant communities know that they are safe to report crimes and to call police and law enforcement, to hold police officers accountable. Uh, police officers have a tremendous job that's really difficult, uh, but the same laws that apply to you and me have to apply to them as well. And ultimately, we need to give people who are brought into the criminal justice system a chance to find a way out. If they've done the hard work of doing the treatment and the things that we've asked them to do after they've been convicted or served their time, we need to be there to help them remove the barriers so that they can get back on their feet and become productive members of society and not be stuck with scarlet letters that trace them and dog them for the rest of their lives so that they can't get back and doing what they need to do to live uh, their lives happily and productively. So there are so many issues uh, that this district attorney is gonna face. Uh, and I believe that my background and experience, not only being a prosecutor, but getting out of the system and working with other system partners gives me the perspective I need to see the bigger picture and to take okay. and build a collaborative uh, group. So I look forward to the conversation. Now let's move on to get our definition of restorative justice. I've known Rabbi Ariel Stone for over 20 years and have had opportunities to turn to her for moral clarity and practical wisdom again and again, because the term of the evening is restorative justice uh, is somewhat complex and young in its usage. It's really only been around since the early 1970s. We need a clear definition for this evening's forum. Let's hear from Rabbi Stone. Rabbi Ariel Stone, representing Portland Interfaith Clergy Resistance, Rabbi of Congregation Sher Tikva of Portland, Oregon. It's clear that we've reached a time in our society where we have to do what we can to address the widespread suffering that all of us see that comes about as the result of a system that is meant to protect us and to correct us, but has come to be understood to do far too much harm. One of the approaches being considered to improve our justice system and make it more just is called restorative justice. Restorative justice sets itself up as a balance to something called a more punitive approach and suggests that the point of justice is not to balance a scales that says an eye for an eye. Now, I come from a tradition that invented the concept of eye for an eye. It's part of the Jewish Bible. But if you look at rabbinic tradition, there is no rabbi for 2,000 years who understands that phrase, eye for an eye, the lex talionis, to actually mean an eye for an eye. The very first thing they ask in the legal deliberations is, what if the offender is blind? It's understood that what we're talking about here is measure for measure. It's easy to confuse equity and equality. It's easy to confuse correction with damage if we lose sight of the unique individuality of every person, and if we lose sight of the fact that every person is equally capable when given the right opportunities, the right support, the right instruction, 
to be a useful and fulfilled part of our society. It also has to be noted that prisons are not eternal. If you look back again at my particular tradition, there's no punishment that includes locking someone up. This is clearly not the only way. And it's not clear that it's the best way to correct where correction is necessary or even to isolate when correction doesn't seem to be working. The restorative approach insists that no human being should be warehoused or forgotten. The restorative approach focuses less on the individual and more on the systems. A restorative approach doesn't say there's no harm and doesn't say there's no evil. It asks us to be smarter about the systems in which harm takes place, about the context and cause of evil. It asks us not to continue doing what we've been doing once we see that doing it isn't helping. Restorative justice focuses on establishing responsibility, not suffering simply because someone else suffered. You can't take out someone's eye just because they put out someone else's eye. It doesn't make sense. Not according to the legal tradition from which I come, for the reason I offered and for many others that they work out. What you can do is make sure that the person who harmed the other person's sight is responsible for now helping them in the situation they find themselves. If you, God forbid, put out someone's eyes, you're responsible for getting them a seeing eye dog. Where possible, restorative justice allows those who suffer to have part of a process in which they can find some healing, some return to wholeness, because they are part of a conversation by which they might point out the best way to offer a restoration for what has been broken. Where possible for the sufferer and the one who caused the suffering to meet as human beings and work that out, not only empowers the victim, but allows for the one who caused the suffering to see some useful action to also help them achieve a certain sense that their worth as a human being is not irreparably damaged by what they have done. Our society cannot afford to lose one individual and the promise and the potential that each of us holds. Well, holding those thoughts in mind, let's proceed to listen to our first question from the public. This will be from Joyce Harris, and I'll ask uh, Ethan Knight to respond first and then Mike to respond second. So let's hear from Joyce Harris. Hello, my name is Joyce Harris, and I'm on the steering committee for the Albina Ministerial Alliance Coalition for Justice and Police Reform. We have for de decades worked on issues related to police reform, justice in the criminal justice system, and community engagement. So my first question is, how will you, as the county's top prosecutor, address the racial disparities in prosecutions, sentencing, and other issues that have impacted the African-American community specifically and in other communities of color? Ethan? Thank you. Well, that's obviously a terrific question uh, and regrettably one that we get asked a lot. And I say regrettably because it underscores uh, how pervasive the problem is. Um, and because the problem of racial inequity in the system uh, is so pervasive, you know, my view really is that it's like a chronic disease. 
Um, and viewing it that way, we really need a multifaceted approach. And so here's what I think about and what I talk about based on my experience in the system. Uh, first, we need to think about outside the criminal justice system first, being advocates um, you know, for dealing with the inequities that often follow someone before and after they ever get into the criminal justice system uh, and addressing some of those structural and institutional inequities. The next piece is on the sentencing front, tracking data and doing a better job to ensure that there's parity for the things that the district attorney can control. Uh, and that includes making recommendations uh, that are equal and effectively uh, neutralize the factor of race uh, in that decision. The next piece is, is ensuring that the office itself in making those decisions more accurately and fairly represents and reflects the community which it represents. And that means ensuring that there's diversity amongst the prosecutors in the office. Uh, and that means uh, doing a better job in hiring. And I did a lot of work on that issue is vice president of the Oregon State Bar and continuing to push for diversity amongst the bar at large, but that's something we need to do a better job, particularly in Portland, Oregon, quite frankly, and I think that'll have an impact. The other piece is doing a better job long-term about thinking about the relationship of law enforcement to the community. I mean, this obviously, as the question alludes to, has been something folks have been working on a long time, but like any chronic condition, you need to continue working on it. Uh, and that means trying and trying and trying again to build those trusting relationships um, between different pieces of the community, between law enforcement and minority communities who have a history of uh, you know, dealing with inequities in the system and inequities in policing. And lastly, I'll say, and this circles back to the role of the district attorney in getting into those charging decisions, uh, and that is being willing to acknowledge um, you know, when confronted with best practices, confronted with data, and confronted with the changes in society and culture, that the things we may have done 10 years ago, 20 years ago, uh, and the information we may have relied on in the past um, are not always accurate. And let me give an example. You know, if there was a period of time 20, 30 years ago, even 15 or 10, when we thought mandatory drug sentences, particularly in the federal system, were a fair and appropriate way to deal with uh, that type of crime. But we know now, of course, that's had a disproportionate impact on the African-American community and on the system as a whole. And acknowledging things like that is the only way we can constructively change in the long term. Thanks, Ethan. Mike, would you answer Joyce Harris's question? Yeah, uh, you know, this is something that's near and dear to my heart. It's something that I've actually been working on ever since I left prosecution. Uh, and so, you know, the way that I've approached it, so to, to know how I will approach it as DA, I'll tell you how I have approached it in my job as the director of the Criminal Justice Commission. Uh, what I've done is we've looked at the data and the research. Uh, I started off, I read a book by Michelle Alexander called The New Jim Crow. And that book is, as many of the viewers are probably aware, details how the war on drugs has had a really disproportionate impact on minority communities in this country. And so what we did is after reading that book, I had everyone in my agency read it. And then we looked at and saw, okay, that's a national story. What's the Oregon story? And we looked at Oregon data. And what we found was consistent with what we saw in the national story, which was that with decades of data from SAMHSA collecting who uses drugs in our community, uh, the data says that we all, no matter what your race or ethnicity, use drugs at very similar rates cocaine, heroin, methamphetamine, marijuana, we use the drugs at very similar rates, between one and 3% of our subpopulations. We took that and overlaid it with criminal justice data. We looked at arrests, we looked at convictions. And as the author in the New Jim Crow pointed out, we saw a lot of disparity. African Americans and Native Americans in Oregon were disproportionately, sometimes five to eight times as great as white people being arrested and convicted for possession of controlled substance. I took that information and I brought together a coalition of stakeholders. I worked with the Attorney General, with Unite Oregon, with Latino Network, with uh, the sheriffs and the chiefs of police. We looked at the data and we made recommendations to the legislature on how to change the law. And I'm happy to report after that law has been in place for almost three years now, we've seen disparity for felony convictions across the state drop precipitously. 
it's had a major impact on changing the disparity uh, for black and native communities. I'm extremely proud of that work. So I tell you that because that is exactly what you can expect from me uh, as district attorney, to work with community organizations, to work with law enforcement partners, to work with legislators, and to make the data open and transparent so that people can actually see what's going on in the system. And then from there, decide what are the best ways to tackle those things. Sometimes it's gonna be policy changes. Sometimes it's gonna be law changes. Uh, but that is what you can count on for me is to be data driven uh, and then to look at where the disparity is and then call it out and speak truth uh, to power and say, this needs to change. It's not just. Uh, and that's what I plan to do as district attorney. Thanks, Mike. That's our first question from Joyce Harris. Let's go on to the second question from my Ed, Fred, friend, Ed Jones. And We'll roll tape and Ed will introduce himself and ask his first question. And we'll have Ethan answer the question first. I'm Edward Jones. I was a trial court judge for 18 years. When I retired in 2017, I was the chief criminal judge in Multnomah County. Multnomah County's Juvenile Services Division endorses restorative justice, which it describes as bringing those who have harmed those who've been harmed, and the community together to repair the harm. Why aren't these principles applied in the adult criminal justice system? Ethan, want to take a whack at that? Absolutely. So uh, the question is, why haven't the principles as articulated by Judge Jones been applied to the adult system in the same manner they have to the juvenile system? Uh, and I guess I've got a two-part answer. Uh, one, the systems and the offenders are different, and two, to some degree, they should both be applied uh, equally to each system. And let me answer and address uh, sort of those, you know, salient points as I see them. Uh, the first is, you know, the juvenile system we've always viewed differently and rightly so because juvenile offenders are different. I mean, I think the recent legislative changes with respect to Measure 11 underscore that point that uh, cognitively juvenile offenders are different. And they're at a different stage in their life where uh, they are amenable to treatment and to uh, forms of sanction uh, that put them in, a, frankly, a different place where there is a better chance we can reduce recidivism. So I think they've, it's always been a more amenable population to restorative justice. And I've certainly seen that both anecdotally and statistically in the time I've handled uh, serious adult cases over the year and examined, you know, thousands of reports uh, detailing criminal histories and what interventions are typically more effective. So that's why we've, you know, embraced restorative um, type reforms in the juvenile system and not the adult system. Now, the second answer I gave, which is, you know, we should look at um, incorporating that underlying goal of restorative justice in the adult system. And I don't see incorporating that goal as being mutually exclusive with other forms of punishment that may be necessary. I mean, incapacitation or deterrence when appropriate, um, but we need to do a better job of incorporating the principles of restorative justice in the adult system. And so I think, you know, uh, the last piece of that then becomes uh, the why, and then it becomes the how. How would we better incorporate those principles? Uh, you know, I think um, having a more robust opportunity for victims to confront de uh, defendants in the adult system, and not just confront in a confrontational sense, but to work toward those restorative goals uh, that sort of are the guiding principles of restorative justice. That's one way to do it. I think having a more needs-based approach for both victims uh, and others who come into the system that acknowledges their unmet needs that can't be addressed by sentencing alone. You know, we've gotten better at, at dealing with that in the juvenile system and frankly with lower level adult offenses as well. I mean, that was one of the guiding principles for the community court program when it was originally enacted 20 years ago. Uh, so that is how we best do that. So again, to recap, I think uh, juvenile offenders are different, but I think we need to do a better job of incorporating those principles in the adult system. And I think we can do that by emphasizing the needs of victims and others in the system in trying to impose the principles of restorative justice. Well, thanks, Ethan. Mike, you wanna take a whack at that question by Judge Jones? Yeah. 
So, I mean, the, the question that the judge asked was, why has this not happened in the adult system? And, you know, I'll just answer that directly. Uh, I think that restorative justice is not well understood and that among law enforcement professionals, it's seen as a soft on crime type response. Uh, that's really unfortunate. And I think that the next district attorney of Multnomah County has their work cut out for them both to convince uh, their own deputies and law enforcement and community members and victims that not only is restorative justice, does it hold the promise uh, to get better results, better public safety results, uh, but it can actually help us get more accountability uh, than somebody uh, just being sent away uh, and having to, to do time on their own. Uh, and I just a quick you know, anecdote about that. You know, I've, I've done a lot of talking to folks in the community about restorative justice, and I've learned a lot over the course, and even before this campaign, but certainly over the course of the campaign. And I've come to realize that restorative justice is, is really a philosophy. Uh, and what it has made me think about is when I was a little kid, and my parents, you know, me and my sister are wailing on each other or something like that. And so what was the worst punishment that my parents could inflict upon me? It wasn't to send me to my room. It was to make me hug my sister and say, tell your sister that you love her. That was the hardest thing for me to do. That was what I did not want to do. I would have more than happily been sent to my room and been mad at my parents and the injustice of the situation and how unfair the world is. Uh, but my parents were smart and they employed restorative justice, as I'm sure many of our parents do. Uh, and they said, no, you got to apologize. You have to make it right. Uh, and then give yourself, give your sister a hug and, and tell her you love her. That's the painful work of accountability. And the way our criminal justice system is set up is it's actually set up to not achieve that. It's set up to keep people separate. Uh, and in talking to a lot of victims, you know, I think that we could do a lot better for them and helping them meet their needs of what they need to heal if the person who did the harm is held accountable in a meaningful way that actually helps the victim get back to where they were or, or, or heal as much as they can. So I think that the reason to the judge's question is because, you know, frankly, we're behind the times. Uh, I think that we should be embracing restorative justice. It has been applied to juveniles. Um, there's a disconnect there because juveniles uh, can be in our juvenile system from, you know, the age of you know, 14 to 25. But if you're charged with a crime at 18, you're in the adult system we should immediately be looking at that 18 to 25 year old group whose brains are still developing uh, and even expanding it beyond that. So I think this is gonna be a real challenge for the next DA to embrace this, but it's one that we should take on. Thanks, Mike. Now let's go on and hear again from Rabbi Ariel Stone. She has a question for both of you and Ethan, you'll answer first again. First, I'd like to ask you, about your view of your responsibility to those communities who have felt the impact of the criminal justice system. For example, families of those who are imprisoned. Um, well, I mean, the district attorney and a prosecutor uh, is responsible for enforcing and upholding the rule of law and for doing everything in an ethical and appropriate manner. Um, you know, to be clear about the role of the district attorney versus other folks in the system, the district attorney and a district attorney, uh, deputy district attorney, can't even have contact with a defendant or members of his or her family. So it's important to understand what those roles and parameters are when I sort of frame my answer to this question. Uh, having said that, you know, I think there is a broader responsibility of a prosecutor um, to again act in an ethical and an appropriate manner and make decisions uh, that are sound in the interest of the community. And part of making those uh, decisions is to do so in a way um, that reduces the impact or the harm on anyone in the system or anyone in the process, um, including um, you know, the families of those uh, who may be incarcerated. Uh, but I'll say primarily, um, you know, that is the responsibility also of the person uh, who is sentenced to take care of their family uh, and to be mindful of those responsibilities. Um, and that's often lost in the system as well. Um, but I think what we need to do a better job, and this question I think hints at the edges of this, is focusing on reentry for those who come through the criminal justice system. Because uh, when we talk about responsibility for those uh, who are in the system and for those who go to prison and their families, uh, we often forget about the importance of reentry. 
And that means doing a better job with probation and parole and ensuring that folks, when they come out of the system, are not burdened uh, by convictions. If they follow the rules and done everything they should, uh, we need to do a better job with expungements. We need to do a better job of mitigating the effects of financial judgments against uh, defendants who come out of the system. So there are things that can be done. But I think at the end of the day, the broader responsibility for a prosecutor is to make the best decisions for everyone in the system involved and not view each prosecution in a vacuum. Uh, and that means when enforcing the law, to take into consideration everyone who walks through that court. And that may be uh, relatives of the victims and it may be relatives of the defendant, uh, but first and foremost, it's the community. Great, thanks, Mike. Uh, excuse me, Ethan. And now, Mike, can you answer the question? Yeah. Uh, so I do think that there's a responsibility uh, of the next district attorney to take this on and, and understand how the decisions of that office impact everybody uh, in our community. Uh, and, you know, it really goes back actually to one of the things I said in my opening statement about what I first saw as a high school teacher. Um, I saw how my students' lives were impacted when one of my students had to spend a weekend in solitary confinement. I saw what that did to his ability to come back and be a student. Uh, I saw what it was like for my students whose parents were in jail or in prison and weren't there to help them do their homework at night, or what that even did to their psyche in terms of what they thought their prospects in life were likely to be when I asked them if they wanted to go to college. Uh, so I think that there is a responsibility for the prosecutor to understand that the decisions that we make, everybody in our community should be taken into account. Uh, so I'll give you an example of a program that I've worked on at the state level. It's called Family Sentencing Alternative Program. Uh, we actually took it from Washington State. Uh, and what we saw was that people who were bound to go to prison, they had committed a crime that was a prison sentence crime. Uh, but instead of giving them a prison sentence, they were given wraparound services uh, with the family unit. And so the, the people that were targeted were people that were the uh, caregivers of dependent children uh, so that we weren't creating yet another uh, circumstance in our system where children would have to enter the foster care system or go to some other um, adult caretakers, but keep the family unit together and use wraparound services uh, that include parenting classes. And what we've seen uh, in Washington state, it's been robustly studied. And in Oregon, we've been doing it now for, I believe, around five years. And we've seen that the recidivism rates of people who have participated in that program compared to their peers are down by 17%. So not only did we get better public safety results, we were able to keep families together. Uh, and I think that's the kind of thing that the next district attorney should be looking at, trying to think about, hey, the decisions that I make are going to have consequences beyond just this incident that's happening that's before us in the courtroom. But I have to think about immigration consequences. I have to think about family consequences, uh, communities that have been disenfranchised uh, because of decades and even centuries of uh, systems that have been designed to oppress them. You know, how can we make sure that we're not disproportionately perpetuating a lot of that uh, going forward? So I think the district attorney has a huge role and a responsibility to the community to look at things that can mitigate the harm the criminal justice system that can do. Thanks, Mike. Now we'll go on to yet another question, this time from Jason Jones, adjunct instructor from Portland State University. I'm Jason Jones, a criminal justice professional and educator based in Portland, Oregon. What specifically are the limitations of restorative justice applications for prosecutors in the district attorney's office? Thank you. Uh, you know, it's an important question because I think it underscores uh, many of the challenges the next district attorney or any district attorney faces in dealing with uh, restorative justice or other programs or aspirational goals they really fall outside of the scope of the district attorney's office, the maybe policy objectives or other areas that we can do little about. You know, I think the limitations, um, unfortunately, really relate to um, what we can do when someone leaves the system. In other words, by law, um, when a case, uh, when the judgment's entered on a case, 
the district attorney or the prosecutor in the case um, does not have a bigger role um, or any role by law in the case anymore. So uh, that means uh, for restorative justice to work effectively, uh, prosecutors have to do everything they can to address the needs of the victim and other folks in the system while that case, case is still in court. And so that really is what I see to be the you know, primary limitation. Uh, it's, you know, what can we do and when can we do it? Um, and so when we talk about perhaps ways to address that limitation or those needs, uh, we need to do a better job first of involving uh, our law enforcement professionals in the process um, and not walling them off. For example, um, you know, with sex crimes in particular, uh, police officers and detectives uh, can work with victims advocates to begin uh, the healing process and the restorative process early on. That's also true for other types of crimes as well. Um, so we need to find ways to work with defense attorneys and to bring um, that restorative process uh, to a quicker start in the system. So it's not simply uh, limited by the quick uh, few court appearances before the person may be done. Uh, so it's really expanding that timeline as the way to deal with the limitations of restorative justice in the system. And so lastly, I think in, you know, having identified what some of the limitations are, we need to talk about, uh, you know, opportunities outside of the formal litigation process to help address restorative justice. And that may mean bringing in uh, the Department of Community Justice and Probation um, with victims advocates who may work in the DA's office. That may mean working more efficiently and effectively with nonprofits who have an understanding uh, of restorative justice, and it may mean that we expand the role of uh, the Victims Fund and Victim Services to go beyond uh, the litigation process, and it may mean ultimately on the restorative end that we do a better job of bringing defense attorneys in uh, to ensure that defendants as part of the restorative process can be engaged after their uh, cases are complete. Because again, all this speaks to the fact that restorative justice um, it's not a quick, finite act. It's part of a long timeline um, that meets the needs of all the parties involved. So we need to do a better job of expanding that timeline. Thanks, Ethan. Mike? So I think one of the big limitations that the next district attorney is going to face in wanting to implement more restorative justice programs uh, is really going to be um, one of resource and, and what doesn't really exist in our community. Um, you know, the volume of cases that the Multnomah County District Attorney's uh, Office handles uh, is on the magnitude of 10,000 plus a year. Uh, so a lot of those types of cases might be cases that are exactly the type of case that we could uh, set up a restorative process in the community. But those resources are not there right now as we speak. So I think there is opportunity for a DA to think creatively and say, we would like to do something that is outside of the system, uh, but we're really gonna need investment and uh, a lot of focus on building up community resources, getting people trained to participate in this, um, all those kinds of things. I've talked to folks at Resolutions Northwest. Uh, I know that we do have professionals in our community. There's the RJ Co, which is the Cooperative of Oregon, the Restorative Justice Cooperative of Oregon. Um, there are professionals in our community that are willing and ready to help uh, educate more people and bring more people into this. But quite frankly, it's just, it's not built up to the level that it needs to be uh, for the next DA to start on day one and really think about embracing restorative practices. Uh, so what that's going to mean is that you're going to uh, need an advocate in the district attorney's office that is willing to take some risks uh, in terms of thinking of what cases could be handled that way, and then slowly kind of grow and hopefully uh, build that demand uh, in the community for more investment into those types of resources. Uh, and you do that by you know, trying things, piloting them, and then checking the outcomes, making sure that we're getting the public safety results uh, that the community needs, uh, that victims, uh, their needs are being met, that it's being a successful program. Uh, but ultimately, there's a lot of building uh, to be done that, that just isn't, the infrastructure is not there right now, because quite frankly, our system uh, has not embraced restorative justice uh, to a large extent. Uh, Ethan brings up the, the point of leaving the courtroom and going to the custody of DOC. That's absolutely another 
uh, factor in terms of the district attorney's role. You can do some things like uh, potentially build into plea agreements, you know, whether or not participation in a restorative process gives you any future benefits. Uh, but really, that is a, another challenge. Um, there are some places that have done some things statutorily uh, to allow district attorney's offices to uh, retake jurisdiction of some cases. Washington state passed a statute similar to that. So there's some things we could do, but right now that doesn't exist either. So that would have to be another thing that we looked at for system uh, changes. Okay, thanks, Mike, and thanks, Ethan. We have got one more question in our first round. And that will come from Tuana Sanchez. We'll hear her introduction, her first question, and then get the first answer from Ethan and the second answer from Mike. My name is Tuana Sanchez. I am the state representative for House District 43 and in North and Northeast Portland. And I am also the director of family services for the Native American Youth and Family Center. How would you as district attorney look at the issue of disproportionate numbers of communities of color in the criminal justice system. Ethan, very similar question to Joyce, but slightly different. Let's hear your answer. I, well, I, again, an important question because it gets at, I think, uh, one of the most significant challenges faced by the criminal justice system uh, and the risk of repeating myself to some degree. Um, I wanna talk again about really what I see as the need for a multifaceted approach uh, talking about, you know, the disproportionate representation of minorities in the system um, and the need really to approach it uh, with an eye toward all the different inputs in the system and the actors in the system uh, in the hope of moving the needle uh, and get away from the idea that you can make one isolated change uh, and expect a different outcome. Uh, have one committee convene and expect a different outcome. Because I think to some degree that's been the approach we've embraced in the past and it's been well intended, but it hasn't really, I think, um, embraced the notion that I talked about earlier that this is really a chronic disease. And to, you know, uh, deal with it once and for all, we need, uh, you know, many different approaches. So again, I'll emphasize those because I think they're important. Uh, the first again is what the district attorney can control uh, in directly, and that is, of course, uh, looking at sentencing outcomes uh, and disproportionate representation in the system of minorities and people of color. And when you look at those numbers, what can you do and can you ensure uh, there is some parity uh, in the plea bargaining and the sentencing phase? So those are the points uh, when you look at uh, the racial and ethnic disparity report that was generated by the standing committee that addressed this issue. They talked about seven different points in the system, uh, two of which can be controlled by the district attorney directly. So what are those points and can they be controlled and what can we do to move the needle? Uh, and then again, to step back, we need to do a better job of, of course, ensuring that folks in law enforcement and the district attorney's office better represent those communities, which and who they serve. Uh, and that's a hiring choice. Uh, but again, I wanna get back to, I think the first point I made on the earlier question, and that is, you know, I think when we talk about, um, you know, the history of disparity in the criminal justice system, and that's a discussion, you know, I've been uh, a party to for years and, you know, been on committees and talked about solutions. I think there is often a failure to recognize uh, when we had that discussion uh, about the institutional inequities that exist throughout, uh, you know, our society and our system. And that means, you know, by the time a criminal defendant may get to the system or even a victim, um, they may have been discriminated against uh, applying for a home loan, at school, applying for a job, I mean, at all these different points. So unless we sort of view this more as a larger societal issue and not simply in the context of the criminal justice system, I think we'll miss an opportunity. So I certainly would like to reiterate, uh, you know, the solutions I talked about earlier, and again, go back to that larger picture that an equity does not just exist in the criminal justice system, it's everywhere and we need to fight it everywhere. Thanks, Ethan. Mike? Uh, so, you know, I think, you know, the first time that the slightly different iteration of this question, I talked a lot about data and uh, the story of how we use data to change our laws in this state, to change disparity uh, for felony drug convictions. You know, I think a big part of that story though was where it started, which was looking at uh, reading the book, right? Uh, looking at the research uh, that was done by a scholar. Uh, I think that's a thing that the next district attorney can do is to bring some of those outside 
uh, sources in terms of continuing legal education into the deputies so that they can be exposed to what is the research saying. Uh, but then even more than that, even that research was predicated on community experience. Uh, and throughout this race, you know, I've worked with uh, groups uh, who are supporting me like the Latino Network and Unite Oregon and uh, Pano and others. Uh, and, you know, I can, I look forward to continuing those relationships uh, because I've been through uh, many legislative committee hearings where people are up there and testifying uh, and talking about their experience of uh, having uh, somebody, you know, getting pulled over for driving while black. Uh, and then describe exactly what happens in that situation when a taillight gets poked out that wasn't a, to the driver's knowledge previously broken. You know, I mean, I think there's a lot of stories and experiences that we need to bring into it. I'm a very quantitative type person. I love data. I love the research. I'm going to be, you know, making the office data transparent, putting it on dashboards for people to use. Uh, but one of the things that I've learned in my experience doing that at the Criminal Justice Commission is it's not a substitute. It really has to be coupled and paired uh, with uh, the qualitative experience of the community uh, and hearing from them firsthand. What are the stories? How are their lives? How have they been impacted? Uh, and, you know, what are the things that they would like to see change? So I think whoever the next district attorney is, is going to have a tremendous responsibility to build those relationships uh, and bring people who have not traditionally been involved in looking at the policies of the district attorney's office, uh, but seeing are we really achieving the goals that we intend to achieve with these policies, or can we achieve public safety but do it in a way that perhaps uh, is not having negative impacts uh, on, on communities and bringing disproportionate uh, communities of color into the criminal justice system. Uh, so really, it's it's both the quantitative, the data side, which is something I look forward to doing, but pairing it with the community and bringing in the community voice to be a piece and, and to be there to, to represent their experience. Thanks, Mike. And that ends round one. Now we're going to take a little break, have a little fun, go a little more quickly, and ask 50 questions of each of these men in just a few minutes. These are questions we're going to keep to just yes or no answers. The purpose of this is to get to know them not as attorneys, not as prosecutors, not as elected officials, but just as people, just people. So we'll just go quickly. We'll have uh, 50 questions, and we'll start each of them just yes or no, and we'll start each of them Mike Schmidt will answer first and Ethan will answer second. We'll see those, those questions on the screen. So first question, cats or dogs? Mike? Dogs. Ethan? Dogs. Salt or pepper? Salt. Salt. <laughs> We're not keeping score here, guys. Number three, <laughs> ducks or beavers? Uh, ducks. Oh, ducks. Do you think the United States is a racist country? Yes. The country, no. Should vaping products be legal? No. No. Have you ever had to run from the police? Yes. Uh, do campus police count? Yes. <laughs> no comment. <laughs> um, did you go to school in Portland? Uh, no, North Carolina. And Mike, uh, did you go? Did you go to school in Portland? Lewis and Clark. Yes. Rock music or country music? Mike first. Rock. Ethan. Rock. Can you change the oil in your own car? It's a Prius, probably not. Ethan? No, I mean, not if I want it to work. Are you fluent in another language, Mike? No. Ethan? Uh, unless you count that four years of Latin, no. <laughs> okay, next question. Have you ever had a felony committed against you? Yes. Yes. 
Do you know how to play a musical instrument, Mike? <laughs> a steel pot? No. No. Mike, have you ever climbed Mount Hood? No. Ethan? Nope. Now, Mike, do you, do you get things done by the deadline or long before? Deadline. Ethan? Deadline. Mike, when you were growing up, did you want to be a lawyer? No. How about you, Ethan? Uh, yes. <laughs> <laughs> okay, here's one. Uh, do you believe in God? Yes. Ethan? Yes. Mike, have you ever seen someone die? Mm, not at the moment, no. Ethan? I'm hesitating because I've seen lots of dead bodies. Um, I don't think, I don't think so. Mike, do you love the holidays? Yeah. How about you, Ethan? I uh, guess. Mike, do you have a sweetheart? I do. And Ethan? <laughs> yes. Mike, do you consider yourself artistic? I do. And Ethan? Uh, yes. Um, Mike, did you know your father well? Yes. How about you, Ethan? Uh, yes. Again, we're not keeping score. It's not a psychological test. Mike, have you been to Sweat Lodge? Um, no. And Ethan? No. For yourself, Mike, would you rather be judged by a judge or a jury? <laughs> uh, we'll go jury. Ethan? Mm, jury. Mike, is it hard for you to accept uh, compliments? No. How about you, Ethan? Uh, increasingly not. Mike, when you meet someone for the first time, are you good at remembering their names? <laughs> it's campaign getting time getting better uh but no not not great how about you ethan no mike do you have a person uh a, a friend who's a person of color a person you talk with say at least once a week yeah how about you ethan yes um have i uh mike have you tr ever tried to be a vegetarian yes <laughs> and ethan uh, yes. Mike, can you ride a horse? Technically, yes. And Ethan, can you ride a horse? I have, um, but <laughs> I can. <laughs> okay. Uh, Mike, uh, I know the answer to this question, but I'm going to ask anyway. Mike, do you have children? I do, two of them. And Ethan, do you have children? Yes, two. How old are your children, Ethan? Uh, 13 and 15. Okay. Uh, and Mike, has anybody in your family ever been to prison? Yes. And Ethan, anyone in your family been to prison? No. Mike, have you traveled in a third world country? Yes. And Ethan? Yes. Um, Mike, have you ever had a family member who had a severe and persistent mental illness? Yes. And Ethan? Yes. Uh, have you ever, Mike, have you ever fired anyone for cause? No. How about you, Ethan? No. Do you uh, plan to continue as district attorney the uh, grand jury review of the jail, Mike? Yes. And Ethan? Yes. Good. Will you continue to uh, release the transcripts for uh, lethal use of force by police, Mike? Yes. And Ethan? Yes. Thank you. Mike, have you ever had no money at all? Um, I can always call my parents, so I guess I'll say no. How about you, Ethan? Probably the same boat. I've had no money, uh, but uh, I, you know, I knew there were people I could call. Mike, have you ever been to Pow Wow? 
Uh, I don't think so. How about you, Ethan? Powwow? <clears throat> Mike, are you a veteran? No. And Ethan? No. Did you serve? No. Uh, Mike, is anyone in your family a first or second generation immigrant? Um, no. And Ethan? No. Uh, Mike, has anyone in your immediate family been on food stamps or Medicaid? Um, no. Ethan? Uh, no. Question. Last question. Have you ever been in, hos in the hospital overnight, Mike? Yes. How about you, Ethan? Yes. Great. Thank you so much. I think that was very illuminating, uh, <laughs> at least to me. Um, and we'll go on now to, uh, to more questions from our public questioners. The next question that I'd like to pose to the candidates is, how will you, in your role as district attorney for Multnomah County, address the issues of mistrust that have existed in those communities for quite a long time by engaging with those communities and being transparent about how your office operates and how it makes decisions. And finally, how will you be responsive to those communities when there are issues that come up? I think it's a good question, Mike. What do you think? Yeah, you know, I think, um, in some ways, uh, that's a great, there's a, it's a great reason why we have uh, campaigns uh, and contested elections. I, and this has been a great opportunity for, for Ethan and myself to, to get out and start building, uh, and meeting people and, and building those connections and networks. Uh, you know, I think that's gonna be a big key for me is continuing on a lot of those relationships. Uh, but to get back to the, the premise of the question, which is how are you going to uh, work on the mistrust that exists uh, between the community and law enforcement. Uh, and, you know, I think there are so many different ways uh, to go about this. You know, one, I think, is, is transparency. Um, I'm very excited, like I've done at the state level, uh, to put and make dashboards, make the work of the district attorney's office available to anybody 24-7 uh, on our website. You know, it's something that I've been able to do at the state level for criminal justice data. And it's not something that's been done uh, across the country in district attorney's offices. So it's not just a criticism of Multnomah County's DA's office, but district attorney's offices are traditionally known as black boxes of information. Uh, and so I think that's one way that we can uh, start to, to be more transparent about who's coming into our system and then the decision points, charging decisions, and then when you get to resolution of the case uh, and then convictions, plea bargains, uh, and moving on from there, making that data transparent. And I think, uh, quite frankly, based on data that I've seen, you know, in some ways the community would be pleasantly surprised once that data becomes public uh, and transparent and out there. And in some ways it's gonna highlight things that uh, the community probably already knew existed and we need to, to do a deeper dive and work on. Uh, so data absolutely is one of the ways to be transparent. Um, you know, building the coalition that I've built in this election uh, with some of the groups that I've already named, uh, I already have a working relationship with them uh, from my time in the Criminal Justice Commission. I intend to continue that. Uh, one of the first things that I would want to do if elected uh, would be to go through the office policy manual uh, and to go, you know, unit by unit, the way that we handle cases and look at it with uh, a lens, a community lens of people that come in and talk about uh, you know, how these policies have impacted their communities over the years and see if there aren't things that we could change from a policy uh, perspective uh, in the district attorney's office. Uh, but I think having the voices of the community uh, at that conversation and people who have been impacted by those policies uh, is gonna be crucial. Um, and so you know, I think it's, it's just gonna be a continuing conversation with some of the coalitions that I've already built uh, throughout this campaign, and then and merging that with uh, increasing transparency of, of who is going through our system and what outcomes we're achieving. Thanks, Mike. Ethan, can you answer Joyce Harris's question about mistrust? 
Absolutely. And I think, you know, the starting point for my answer to the question uh, is uh, the beginning of the question, which is mistrust and how do you address it and how do you think about what that means? Uh, and I can talk about specific ways uh, to increase transparency and engagement because, of course, those were other components of the question. Uh, but when you talk about mistrust in any relationship, I think the key piece is trying to rebuild that trust at the front end. And that involves really listening and acknowledging the basis for the mistrust. You know, over the years, I think what I've seen a lot of um, is sort of a, you know, passive um, or kind of half-hearted acknowledgement of why there's mistrust uh, between law enforcement and communities of color and other communities without really listening to the basis of that, without really stopping to understand what it's like. Uh, to be in a position where you feel like, you know, you're either powerless uh, or you haven't been listened to continually. Um, and so I think, you know, the first piece of that is trying to listen and be aware. It doesn't mean you always agree, uh, but trying to engage communities who've been marginalized and trying to involve them in the process. So then that gets to the three specific points of the question. You know, the first uh, and being more engaging um, you know, that's a key piece of, you know, any relationship I think an elected official, particularly a district attorney needs to have, um, and it's to use the existing structures and to expand those community relationships. And then the next piece, of course, is being transparent. You know, we can do that with officer-involved shootings, but it also involves being transparent uh, with the data uh, that Mike's alluded to, but I talked about in the answers about racial disparities in the system, ensuring that there's parity in that data that relates to how we're treating everyone in the system is available for people to see, because uh, that helps, I think, get to that core uh, trust issue. Uh, and the last piece of the question really was about responsiveness. And that goes to trust and mistrust as well. You know, I think that, um, you know, part of being, um, you know, trusted uh, is having, you know, leaders and institutions that are responsive to everyone equally. And, you know, I'm a big believer in wanting people to have faith in institutions and they should believe in them. But to do that, you have to be responsive. And if people don't feel like they have a voice, um, you don't get very far. So, you know, what I see my role is as a district attorney uh, is to do a better job of being simply present in the community, um, helping to listen, helping to bridge that gap and helping to be more responsive. So when we encounter those difficult times, uh, when there are situations with law enforcement in the community, uh, it's not the first time that I'm there or members of my office are there, uh, that those relationships are nurtured and sustained for a long period of time. Thanks, Ethan. Now let's go on and hear the next question from Judge Ed Jones. Could you tell us about a situation in which you were able to apply restorative justice principles in your work? Mike, can you answer Judge Jones' question? Uh, let's see. In my in my work, I'm going to pivot slightly and apply it in my daily life. Um, you know, I uh, was oh I don't know several months ago now. I walked out to the curb and saw that my car had some fresh damage uh, on it, and you know that was a bummer. And I called the insurance company and I started all that process and so on and so forth. Uh, but then I, you know, after I had come back for the day, I saw another car parked on my street that also had fresh damage on it. And it appeared to me that the uh, paint from that car matched the paint that was now streaked uh, on my car. Uh, and I knew who was driving the car. And so I walked up to uh, the house and the gentleman whose car it was, was uh, sitting there. Uh, and I said, hey, you know, I, I see that uh, my car seemed to be hit this morning. And uh, you know what, uh, I noticed there's some damage on your car. And uh, after a little bit of back and forth, um, you know, and, and a little bit of denial, uh, you know, we worked out a, a solution, a resolution. Uh, I had to pay a deductible to get the damage uh, fixed. And because, uh, you know, I wasn't, I, now I had now figured out who it did the damage. I was paying the full deductible on that. And so I'd said, hey, uh, you know, you need to make this right for, for me and, and, and cover that expense. Uh, and so, you know, even though there wasn't a full uh, accounting or accountability for that, he made good on that. And we handled it uh, over the course of several months and him making installment payments to me to cover my deductible. 
So, you know, I mean, that's just a, a situation in my real life that happened not too long ago where, you know, instead of engaging, which I certainly could have and called the police and gone through what so many people would rightfully uh, would do, uh, you know, I decided to engage the person. Um, and, you know, I, that's part of my privilege as a, as a white male who's uh, taller than average, uh, that I feel comfortable enough doing that. Uh, but, you know, we, 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 we worked out a resolution that uh, was sufficient. And, uh, you know, I think we both ended up uh, being better off for, for handling it that way. Thanks, Mike. Ethan, can you answer uh, Ed Jones's question? Sure. I, I, I've got two examples that take me back to my time in the district attorney's office when I think about the principles of restorative justice uh, in my job and when they've been applied. You know, in the first involved a vehicular homicide case I handled. Uh, and, you know, of all of the violent crime and cases I prosecuted, in some ways, those vehicular homicide, and that means someone who's been charged with a crime for, you know, killing someone with their car, usually a drunk driver, were some of the most challenging uh, because there was a randomness to those crimes that just took the families aback uh, in a way um, and with a kind of sadness I rarely saw um, in other cases. And there was one in particular um, where uh, it was, you know, someone with no criminal record um, had killed somebody else um, while extremely drunk. And they were sentenced, we got to a resolution that was appropriate, but it was clear to me, you know, having worked with the victim's family throughout the process, that there was something missing. Um, and when we finished that process, I stayed in touch with them and helped sort of talk through the mundane pieces of the case um, and the process with them afterwards and got them in touch with victim services. Um, but it, I think it was cathartic for both of us to try and put together what had happened uh, in a way that was restorative beyond that prison sentence. Um, and I, I'm not gonna use the names, but I remember that distinctly. And the next was, I was in a stadium for Meyer grocery store uh, about 15 years ago, 14 years ago, and a woman came up to me in the aisle and said, well, do you recognize me? Uh, and I said, I'm sorry, I don't. And she said, well, I was a juror on the aggravated murder case you tried uh, about a month ago that had gone on for about two months. And of course, with the jurors, you're not right up in front of them. Uh, and it was an extraordinarily horrendous case, uh, mutilated bodies, rape, torture. Um, and she said to me, you know, the case was over. And so in my mind, that's it. And this was a juror, so somebody else in the process. She goes, well, thank you for your work. It was a good case. Uh, it was handled well. She goes, you know, I've been in therapy for, it would have been two months, the two months since the trial. And it occurred to me, and I didn't think about it, you know, at age 30 in the terms of restorative justice, what I thought about was how remarkable it was that this person was so impacted by the system when I only saw it as cases and process and litigation and on to the next one. Uh, and this woman is crying, describing the therapy she's in for what the system had done and not complaining about her role as a juror. And so when we got into this campaign and I thought about the needs of people in the system, I thought about her and that, you know, the importance of recognizing that trauma is a piece of the system for everyone who's involved and we can't lose sight of that uh, or we'll lose our humanity in the system. Thank you, Ethan. Now we'll go on to a question from the Rabbi Ariel Stone. I'm also interested in your views on challenges to convictions where there is evidence of innocence or prosecutorial misconduct. So Mike, prosecutorial misconduct. Yeah, well, you know, we've talked a lot about building trust with the community and legitimacy and the challenges that the criminal justice system has and does currently face with that trust relationship. And prosecutorial misconduct is absolutely um, not tolerable because, you know, not only is it wrong in the instant case uh, where you know, our role is to seek justice. It's, it's not to win, it's to have a just outcome. Uh, but so it's wrong in the instant case, but it's also, it is that damage uh, and it, it will continue to perpetuate the damage and the mistrust between the community uh, and the prosecutor's office uh, if it's not handled. 
one of the things that you know I would love to do, and and I think we are um, going to be going into budgetary times that are probably unprecedented. Uh, but one of the things that I would love to do is have an integrity unit uh, in the office, and there's some of that now, but I think it really needs to be made more robust. Uh, that would work with groups like the Innocence Project when they bring up cases. Uh, where they have real concerns and where they want to see things uh, be tested for DNA evidence, uh, for example, uh, and working with them to be collaborative to get testing of uh, old cases to make sure that justice was done. Because look, even when we are doing our best and, and everybody has the best intentions and nobody's trying to do the wrong thing, mistakes can be made. Uh, and I think that we just all have to acknowledge uh, that that's the case and be open when somebody else brings a legitimate claim uh, and, and be open that the evidence could, uh, if examined again, lead us in another way. Uh, so having that unit uh, in the office that is willing to work with partners uh, like that uh, at the Innocence Project to, to see if we can objectively look at those cases again. I think to do that, uh, to do it right, you would really want to have a, a unit who handles just that, that works on uh, those kind of integrity type cases that would hopefully be uh, you know, a little bit insulated from the, wet, the rest of the office, because I think there is uh, an internal pressure that can apply, especially if the original attorney who worked on that case is still in the office. Uh, to not um, you know, dig into those cases. So you need to have a strong leader who's going to uh, make sure that there is that kind of a walled off aspect to that unit where prosecutors can actually look at cases. I think we also need to be open to the idea that uh, the science has changed. Uh, there's a lot of research out there and, and, and literature written on uh, forensic evidence and what has changed over time. And if there are cases that have been decided on, on evidence that is, is no longer reliable in the scientific community, we should be looking at those cases as well. Uh, so I think this is a crucial um, area where the DA can help build uh, back the legitimacy and the trust of the community. Thanks, Mike. Ethan, would you answer the question? Absolutely. So uh, obviously institutional trust is sort of, to me, uh, the key piece uh, of an answer to the question and when we talk about um, you know, examining prosecutions uh, and ensuring that they are indeed uh, appropriately brought or based uh, if there are questions about their legitimacy. So, I mean, for starters, you know, I've got significant background in this as someone who's prosecuted public corruption cases, um, but on the legal side, I'm intimately familiar with the processes, processes um, used to evaluate uh, post-conviction, um, you know, convictions, uh, how they're managed, how they're handled, and the best way to challenge them. And the other piece is, of course, we need to ensure uh, that there's a, you know, a robust and transparent litigation process. You know, the best way to ensure um, that the rights of everyone have been preserved in the process is to ensure that there's adequate representation on both sides and there's transparency. And that's why I've been a long uh, standing advocate for pay parity between prosecution uh, and criminal defense lawyers like we have in the federal system uh, and ample support uh, for uh, indigent defense and criminal defense uh, services so that when those challenges are made, uh, defendants have the representation they need to make them because the statutes exist uh, to challenge convictions. And let me speak to the conviction integrity piece of this. Uh, there is a deputy DA now who handles conviction integrity, and I've talked a fair amount with the folks at the Innocence Project uh, over the years. Um, and, you know, they, the DA's office is generally responsive. They're overwhelmed. Um, so I think really the thing we need to think about, too, is ensuring uh, that there are enough resources on the defense side uh, to bring those challenges if they're uh, merit-based. Um, and, you know, to be able to support the interests of defendants who believe that a prosecution may be, uh, you know, based on faulty evidence or faulty facts, because nobody wants that in the system. And I think we need to do a better job of ensuring that if there are questions, uh, they're properly vetted in the process. Uh, and the other way to do that, too, I mean, if you want to address the concern Mike has about somebody in the office being too close to the case, uh, the way that's handled is not internally, then it's... Um, through another office. Uh, that's a you know a proper basis for recusal for an examination of a case 
or you go through the state attorney general's office uh, in the post-conviction litigation section if you really need to wall it off or examine um, after the fact um, you know, a piece of a criminal case. So there are lots of mechanisms to do it, but I think we need to do a better job of offering the support um, so those cases can be brought because, you know, the last thing we want, the last thing I've ever wanted as a prosecutor, is there to be any question about the legitimacy of a conviction because that hurts every one of us in the system. Thank you, Ethan. We'll go on now to another question from Jason Jones. How can restorative justice exist with the existing framework of the criminal justice system? Mike, can you answer that question from Jason? Yeah, it's, it's a fantastic question because um, really our entire system of justice is set up to do the opposite of what the restorative philosophy would have us do, which is uh, to bring somebody, the person who caused harm, uh, and hold them accountable and make them a part of the process, hopefully in the healing of the victim. Everything in our criminal justice system is designed to keep people separate, uh, to keep them apart. Uh, so, you know, I think it really is going to be a challenge. There's uh, the extrajudicial ways just working outside the system where a district attorney could say by policy um, that there are certain types of cases or crimes that they would be willing to handle in a restorative manner or framework outside uh, the criminal justice system. Uh, and, you know, you would put up policies around that in terms of, uh, you know, talking with the victim, making sure that they are on board with that. Uh, because ultimately, I think the restorative piece has to be the focus, and that's restoring the victim. Uh, and, and helping them heal. So you want to make sure that the victim would be on board with that type of a process uh, and then handling it outside of the criminal justice system would be one way. Inside the criminal justice system, uh, I've talked with district attorneys. I, I spoke with a DA uh, in an elected DA in a different state who actually um, did build restorative justice into his office, into his agency, people that could practice that and be the actual people who engage with both the, the victim and the defendant. Uh, I'm ultimately not convinced that that's necessarily the best way to go about it. Uh, it's something I would learn more about, but I, I actually think that having the, the professionals doing the restorative work outside of the district attorney's office uh, is probably the best way to go about it. Uh, so there's the extrajudicial way. Uh, and then there is just once somebody is sentenced, a lot of times, you know, especially for some of the more heinous crimes uh, in our system. And I've talked to people who have been victims uh, of their family members have been murdered. Uh, and <clears throat> there's a, a judge over in Washington County, Judge Tom Cole, whose daughter uh, was a murder victim. Uh, and, you know, he decided that he did want to engage at some point, and he's a very religious man. And so he, he came at it from a religious perspective, but he kind of made that connection with the person who murdered his daughter and, and, and got what he wanted to do in terms of healing from that process. Um, so there is, there are ways that it can be done, but that was very initiated by, by Judge Cole. Um, you know, I think building up avenues to, to make that available, because sometimes, you know, when we're dealing with the case, it's, it's too fresh, it's too early to, to, to go into a, a more restorative process. But at some point, the victim might decide that's what they would like to do. And we should help build resources. So they can do that. Thanks, Mike. Ethan, would you answer the same question? Well, I, you know, I think Mike appropriately gets to the fact that there are some ways in which uh, it's a tough fit with the existing system. Um, but I'm, you know, I guess I'll approach it from the perspective of, um, you know, there are some contours to our system that are not going to change um, so long as we have the U.S. Constitution uh, and a framework that's set up. Um, and so having said that, really the question as I see it is, um, you know, what can we do to make it um, and there are things, um, and you know, I, I, there are things that I think are not mutually exclusive with the existing framework we have and the existing system we have. And it really, to me, gets back to what I alluded to before, which is sort of a temporal expansion of, you know, how do we involve um, the restorative process at different points in the system that we don't have right now. Um, and that may be extrajudicial uh, is the way Mike described it. 
um, but it can be done. And, you know, I think, you know, when I talk to people about this concept, and as I said before, you know, um, I can articulate generally what it is now, but for years, I didn't really know what it was, even though I worked in the system. You know, a lot of prosecutors I talk to, they're amenable to it. Uh, it's not something people say, well, that's a bad idea. Um, and particularly if it supplements or augments what's already in the system, you know, for a lot of them, it is simply like, how do I fit this into a system and a practice that's rigid and I have, you know, limited resources uh, in to begin with? So it gets us back to how do we involve um, other stakeholders in the restorative justice process? Uh, you know, our victims advocates um, and our defense attorneys in some ways um, are two of the best, you know, avenues to expand that. Because of course, you know, you need to have the defendant at the table for the restorative process um, and prosecutors can initiate that. And for the victims advocates whose work often goes unheralded and, and is misunderstood, they have a better understanding of the needs issue that, uh, you know, we often fail to recognize we, and I speak as a prosecutor, you know, I, you intellectually know the needs, but, you know, the key piece of, you know, restoration and the restorative justice piece is addressing those needs and those victims advocates have their finger on the pulse of the emotional needs there. So to me, it's, again, involving other stakeholders who are in the criminal justice system, in the litigation process, at different points in the process from involving officers uh, earlier on, and then having folks more active when Department of Corrections is involved, that's what you need to do. And it's a heavy lift, and Mike alluded to the resource issue earlier. Um, it's not out there, but if we're committed to this, then that has to be the focus. How do we make it work with what we have? Because um, that is the most practical way I see to making this a reality. Thanks, Ethan. We'll hear one more question from the public from Tuana Sanchez, Oregon House Representative. And then we're gonna hear the uh, statements from both campaigns, uh, both candidates' supporters. Going forward at this moment in time and looking at the numbers of people that we have in our criminal justice system, in our Department of Corrections, that are alcohol and drug related um, and or mental health related issues, those folks that have those issues, how would we do this differently? Mike, can you answer, Tanya? Yeah, you know, I think uh, we should be rethinking about uh, how we're how we're doing this thing and where we've gotten to where we are. I was privileged to go to Norway and tour their prison system. Uh, Norway is a country that's actually relatively similar in size uh, to Portland or to Oregon, uh, about I think 4.8 million people or so, uh, and we're over 4 million in the state of Oregon. So very similar size. Uh, and, but where we have, I think, 14,500 or so people in prison, they have about 2,500 people in prison. Uh, so it can be done. We see in Norway and, and other examples across the entire world uh, that, that other communities do not rely on incarceration the way that we do. And they're just as safe, if not safer, than we are. Uh, you know, the United States is a real outlier in how much incarceration we use. So I think, you know, we have to have brave and hard and challenging conversations uh, because, you know, quite frankly, and, and the representative's right, uh, when you look at who's in our prisons, you know, addiction is a, is a main driver, uh, mental illness is a main driver, trauma, domestic violence are drivers uh, of people who are incarcerated. Uh, but in Oregon, you know, a lot of the people who are incarcerated, and in fact, you know, uh, about half, if not more, are in there for mandatory uh, Measure 11 crimes. Uh, for, and those are serious crimes. Those are not, uh, you know, light uh, types of crimes. Um, so if we really want to do something differently, we have to have brave conversations about how we are sentencing people for some of the worst crimes uh, in our community. Uh, in Norway, it's uh, a, a maximum sentence of 21 years. I'm not suggesting that that's the right answer, but you know, I think other places have confronted this and come to um, drastically different conclusions than we have. Uh, so I think you know, restorative justice, uh, there's an amazing book uh, called Until We Reckon by Danielle Sered. Uh, and she talks about how restorative justice actually can hold the keys to ending mass incarceration. Uh, so I think there's promise there, and she makes a very compelling case and from her work in Brooklyn of what she's seen possible using restorative justice on violent crimes. 
so in the research uh, that she's seen in terms of their recidivism rates is extremely uh, is extremely good and, and actually way better than the results that we get from our traditional incarcerative system. Uh, but we need to have a, a very brave conversation about how we are uh, sentencing people uh, in this state if we ever want to um, change the trajectory that we've been on in terms of how much incarceration uh, that we use. So I think it's, uh, it's going to take real leadership and uh, a lot of education and, and understanding and dialogue with the community if we ever want to do something different. Thanks, Mike. Ethan? Oh, well, well, the question is how we do this differently, and I think the starting point is you have to start early. Uh, I think as someone who spent decades in the system, seeing every type of criminal defendant you can imagine, this notion that the criminal justice system and incarceration exists in a vacuum um, is, of course, wildly off. And if you look at, uh, you know, the history of incarceration in the United States and what's got us there between misguided policy and social policy, you can't ignore the other factors that are present. So Mike brings up Norway. That's a great example. Not the Norwegian correctional system uh, with a sentencing cap, but you need to look at the demographics of Norway, uh, the incidence of uh, addiction, uh, controlling for alcohol, but substance abuse, uh, and mental health, single parent households, poverty in the country of Norway, and long term, if you track and correlate those social factors with the rates of incarceration, the type of crimes that are committed there, um, you see that that has a big impact with on who is going uh, to prison. And so that gets us to what do we do differently in this country? Um, you know, the reality is uh, we need to do a better job if we're really going to have an honest or brave discussion about incarceration ask ourselves, is it good that people are using methamphetamine at an early age and expect a different outcome uh, when they're breaking into cars in their 20s? Um, so, you know, there are lots of things we need to do differently that go beyond the system that get to that ultimate question, why do we have people locked up as long as we do? Um, there have been mistakes made, I think, long term in this country and thinking about incarceration is an answer to all our problems. I think if we talk about Multnomah County, and that is the office we're in fact running for, uh, the rates of incarceration, uh, the rates of sentencing imposition uh, are much lower in Multnomah County than the rest of the state, uh, as they should be in my view, um, and they are different than the rest of the country. In Multnomah County and the District Attorney's Office has 12, I believe, alternative incarceration programs that capture many different kinds of offenses. Uh, but at the end of the day, we need to think very carefully about, you know, causation and all of these underlying issues. So when I talk about the importance of programs, as I have throughout the campaign, they're not programs for program's sake or simply to cut the number of Department of Corrections referrals down. They are targeted addressing, you know, the intractable, difficult issues with mental illness and addiction uh, and folks who need services who are coming back into the community. Because until you break that cycle and get into those underlying causes, um, you know, you're really not doing uh, long term what you would hope to do, which is put us out of business. And I think that's probably the one thing Mike and I can agree on, which is objectively, the best thing that can happen is uh, there's no more work for people like us in the prosecution business. Uh, it's aspirational and uh, probably unrealistic, but I think if we want to look at how we get there, uh, we need to think about all of the different causes of incarceration in our society. Thanks, Ethan. And now we're going to hear the closing, some uh, statements of the supporters of both candidates. And first we'll hear from Dr. Elizabeth Lottie for Ethan Knight. Hi, I'm Dr. Elizabeth Lottie. I'm an assistant professor of medicine at OHSU. It gives me great pleasure to offer my support for Ethan Knight to be our next district attorney. I've known Ethan and Elizabeth Knight for 13 years. Ethan has integrity and humor, but most importantly, he cares deeply for this community. I have followed his career closely, always wondering what might be next. I couldn't be happier to see him on the ballot. Ethan is the right candidate to improve the public safety of our community. He has spent his entire career in public service, working in our state and federal criminal courts. This hands-on experience with thousands of local residents who have come into contact with our criminal justice system has given him the insight to respond to the needs of our community. One of the things I am most impressed by is that he understands the connection between mental health, 
addiction, and repeated cycles of entering our criminal justice system. As healthcare professionals, we know that these underlying conditions can be much bigger determinants of whether someone reoffends than any criminal sentence. Ethan helped create the community courts here in Multnomah County that serve as alternatives for incarceration for those dealing with addiction and mental health challenges. I see firsthand how social determinants of health impact people's ability to get the compassionate care they need from all our systems. I trust Ethan to take the right approach when it comes to getting people on the better path. He's not a politician and he's not going to be afraid to ruffle feathers if that's what it takes. It's not talked about much in this race, but the budget of the district attorney's office has been cut repeatedly over the last several years. These cuts make it harder to staff these community courts, makes it harder to give the attention to each case and harder to determine the best course of action. Of course, all of this has taken a dramatic turn with the COVID-19 pandemic we are living through. Healthcare services are stretched thin and forms of treatment must be adapted in the coming months to deal with the ongoing risk of spreading the virus. In this moment, we need leaders with experience to work within the system to ensure we preserve essential services and focus on what will make the biggest impact. It would be nice if we could experiment or push forward with new initiatives, but for the next few years, we simply won't have that luxury. And this is an office that isn't going to allow for on the job learning. We face big challenges and I know Ethan is up to the challenge. Great. And now we'll hear from Casey Chama for Mike Schmidt. Hi, my name is Casey Chama. I am the executive director of United Oregon Action. For the first time, United Oregon Action decided to endorse political candidates. We're very excited to endorse Mike Schmidt for Multnomah County District Attorney race. Why? Because we know our criminal justice system is broken and it needs to be fixed. We need a leader with a bold, progressive ideas. And Mike is that leader. Let me give you an example. In 2017, I was part of the Attorney General's Task Force to end racial profiling and to fix our drug policies. As part of Task Force, what we needed was data and information that helped us, us to make the right decision. We all agreed the person we need to call was Mike Schmidt. Mike came to the meeting prepared. He came with data and facts. He showed us the data that is that people of color, immigrant refugees, and low-income communities are disproportionately impacted by our drug policies. And all of us who were part of the task force agreed we need to change that and we need to fix. As part of that policy, thousands of Oregonians benefited and was prevented to get convicted in felonies. That's why I'm asking you to support Mike Schmidt for Multnomah County District Attorney Race. Please vote in May for Mike Schmidt for District Attorney Race. Thank you. Great. Now we'll have closing statements from both of the candidates, three minutes long. Can we start with Ethan Knight? Thank you. Uh, and thank you again, Jason, uh, and for everyone um, and our sponsors this evening for having us and giving us this opportunity to talk about restorative justice, but also to talk more broadly about many of these issues um, that Mike and I both care about uh, and that impact our community broadly as we face uh, the next few years uh, in a crisis, but more importantly, in leading one of the most important offices in the community. Uh, when we started, I talked about my love of this community and how that frames my view and my vision for the Multnomah County District Attorney's Office. And that's where I want to end this evening. You know, I believe very strongly there are some things we can do better. Um, but I also know that having spent 20 years in the system, there are some things we do right and things that we need to continue to do to make the criminal justice system work for everyone. Uh, my experience and my understanding of this system uh, has been laid out in great detail throughout this campaign uh, and I think is underscored by the type of support and the breadth of support I have in the legal community from our current district attorney 
and from those who work in the system and know in detail uh, what it's going to entail to run this office and do it in the coming years. In talking about my vision, you know, I believe in throughout my career and even going back before that, uh, that the poor uh, in particular and people of color are disproportionately impacted by our institutions and by our criminal justice system. And I believe that we need to be fair and even handed in addressing those inequities and disparities, not just with defendants, but victims who come through the system, uh, who at their neediest moment and through no fault of their own need a voice. Um, and that voice needs to be given as we deal with an increasing epidemic of low level offenses um, and injustice in our system. And the only way to effectively do that is to have, some, have someone with a vision and an understanding of which low level courts are necessary, which alternatives to treatment can be effective, and which forms of restorative justice can work within our system. And of course, that is uh, the cause for us being here this evening. You know, I've seen throughout my time in the system uh, that there are opportunities uh, to expand our understanding for victims and defendants and their families of the needs uh, that they have and do have in the system. And I will work and continue to work uh, to bring a restorative justice mindset, not simply the programs, but a mindset to the district attorney's office and to the deputy district attorneys that work for me in prosecuting those 10,000 crimes that we'll have to prosecute regardless. And in trying to bring that frame of mind and that mindset, uh, I will, uh, I believe, um, help lead the community in a way that's responsible and respectful of the justice system, but also builds that trust that has been lost in certain quarters of our community. So with that, I wanna ask for your support and your vote on May 19th, and thank you all of your participation and thoughtful questions this evening. Thank you and good night. Thanks, Ethan. Mike, final statement. Great. Well, thank you, Jason, and, and everybody uh, who submitted questions. I think this was a good night to highlight some things that, honestly, uh, I think I started off uh, before behind the scenes talking about this was our eighth uh, candidates forum. And, uh, you know, I got some questions tonight that I haven't had yet. So I really appreciate the effort and the thought that was put into this. Uh, you know, I started this campaign uh, ultimately because I believe that we need major reform now in our criminal justice system. Uh, and I think now is the time uh, and not to be scared away from that. And we're going to be facing a lot of challenges, uh, absolutely, that we haven't been faced uh, with before with the COVID-19 virus. Uh, but within that are opportunities. And we're already seeing this in every industry across our, our state and across our country that people are adapting and we're doing things in new ways. The Multnomah County jail population is down, my understanding is at 40% right now. Well, I wanna know what is the long-term impact on crime for having 40% less incarceration in our jails? I think that we need somebody who's gonna look at this not only as one of the biggest challenges, and it uncertainly is that, but also an opportunity to think about if the ways that we've always been doing things are the ways that we have to keep doing them. You know, I think we've, uh, this has been a great campaign in a lot of ways, but we have two very different uh, candidates in this office or for this race. You know, one is somebody who spent their entire career in the system. Uh, you know, I've been out. I started in the prosecutorial system and I did that uh, from 20, 2007 to 2013, but I've been out since then. And I've been working with the health system, with people in our foster care system to see how we could reduce foster care uh, reliance and, and, and looking at our addiction system and helping build coalitions and programs at the state level to start actually getting at the root causes of these crimes. You know, I think we need somebody who has to lead this office, who has that experience of working with stakeholders uh, outside and not just thinking that the answer to every single problem we have is a prosecutorial one, but that we need to be thinking more creatively about how we can do things differently. And quite frankly, we're going to have to do that. So I've been so uh, honored to receive uh, so many endorsements in this race. Uh, so many labor organizations uh, like AFSCME and AFL-CIO and the Carpenters and the UFCW, the Grocers, uh, but then also into communities of color, uh, Unite Oregon, like Casey Jama, who had such great words, uh, Apano, Latino Network, who are phone banking for me as we speak uh, in this race, uh, elected officials, the governor of this state, Kate Brown, uh, you know, former Governor Barbara Roberts and Governor Kitzhaber, 
uh, you know, this is a huge amount of, uh, of a coalition that's been built. And we've been recognized now by the Mercury, the Oregonian, the Willamette Week, and the Scanner as the right candidate to take over this office. So I appreciate the opportunity and I hope you vote for me on or before the 19th. Thanks, Mike, and thanks to you both.